started streaming. What's up, everyone? Happy Sunday. I don't usually come on on Sundays. Actually, I did a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago or so. And uh, I put out a video on Friday. It was a top 10 metal, Spotify metal playlist. So I thought I'd come on on a Sunday. Kind of change it up a little bit. Uh, let's see here. Discount code for today's live stream is RB500. Kind of a different sale. 50% off my Beato book, ear training, and quick lessons, my guitar course. So um, this is actually an unusually good sale. If you're going to buy any one of these, this is the time to do it if you don't already own it. These are educational products that also go to support the channel. If you see me shaking like this, it's because I shake my legs and I can't help it. And I haven't shaved in a few days, and I'm noticing that my beard is getting dark here, and I'm starting to get dark hair in my hairline again. I can't figure that out. Why? I haven't changed my diet or anything, but that's very strange, right? Okay, uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, an article that Ted Joya just put out. I love Ted's writing. He's... Uh, uh, writes about music. Uh, this is actually from the Atlantic, but I also follow Ted on his Substack um, that I subscribe to, and uh, he's just a really great um, contemporary voice on music. And uh, I'm going to read you some of his article. His article is entitled, similar to my title, because I got my title from his. He says, is old music killing new music? Question mark. Old songs now represent 70% of the U.S. music market. Even worse, the new music market is actually shrinking. Uh, old songs now represent 10% of the U.S. market, according to the largest or latest numbers from MRC Data, a music analysis firm. Those who make a living from new music, especially the endangered species, um, I'm sorry, those who make a living from new music, especially that endangered species, spe <laughs> species, that's easy for you to say, known as the working musician, should look at these figures with fear and trembling. But the news gets worse. Oh, gr <laughs> great, Ted. The new music market is actually shrinking. All the growth in the market is coming from old songs. And he goes and he shows up that, shows that uh, a chart that says that catalog share from 2020 to 2021, catalog music, has gone up 19.3%. Um, and, uh, and the, uh, total, uh, uh, let's see, current share, uh, or then he says here, the, the 200 most popular new tracks now regularly account for less than 5% of total streams. That is hard to believe. Let me say this again. The 200 most popular new tracks. Okay. These are the things that like on Spotify playlists now regularly account for less than 5% of total streams. That rate was twice as high just three years ago. The mix of songs actually purchased by, computer, uh, by consumers is even more tilted towards older music. Well, that's, that, that's not surprising to me. Um, he says uh, he encountered this phenomenon recently at a retail store where, young, the, uh, where the youngster at the cash register was singing along with with Sting on Message in a Bottle, a hit from 1979 as it blasted on the radio. A few days earlier, he had a similar experience in a local diner where the entire staff was under 30, but every song was more than 40 years old. Okay. Um, he says here, Never before in history have new tracks attained hit status while generating so little cultural impact. This is honestly a big topic of my, my streams when I do these Spotify playlists. And you see it in the comments of these. It's not just old people commenting that they don't like the new music, like the new metal playlist that I had just put up, the top 10 Spotify metal, which, by the way, radically changed from day to day. I've never seen anything like it. The other, uh, the other charts don't change nearly as much as that. Uh, it says, uh, Ted goes on to say, in fact, the audience seems to be embracing the hits of decades past instead. Success was always short-lived in the music business, but now even new songs that become bona fide hits can pass unnoticed by much of the population. Only songs released in the past 18 months are classified as new. So people could conceivably be listening to a lot of 
two-year-old songs rather than 60-year-old ones. Um, let's see. He says, uh, he talks about that the lack of reaction when the Grammys were postponed. Um, because the cultural response was a little little more than a yawn. I follow a few th thousand of music professionals on social media, and I didn't encounter a single expression of annoyance or regret that the biggest event in new music had been put on hold. That's ominous. Um, let's see here. The, the, and then he goes on talking about the declining TV audience for the Grammys. Viewership collapsed 53% in 2021 from the previous year. Um, and it said uh, the millions of viewers, if you go back to 2012, 40 million viewers, 2021, 8.8 .8 million viewers, viewers. I mean, that is unbelievable, right? Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's descending pretty much all the way. 40%, 28%, 28, 25, 26, 19, uh, 19, 18, 8.8. And it says, consider these other trends. The leading area of investment in the music business is old songs. Investment firms are getting into bidding awards to buy, to buy publishing catalogs from aging rock and pop stars. The song catalogs, he talks about Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, Bruce Springsteen, um, and a lot of that. Um, uh, and he says, every major label group are participating in this uh, rush to old music. Universal, Sony, Warner Music, they're all buying up old catalogs. Best-selling physical format music is the vinyl LP, which is more than 70 years old. Um, I see no signs of record labels investing in newer, better, better alternative because here too, old is viewed as superior to new. Um, uh, let's see, as record labels lose interest in new music, emerging performers desperately search for other ways to get exposure. Okay, so what are these other ways? TikTok. I have a video coming out where I interviewed a couple A&R people and they are talking about how they, I mean, they pretty much just go to TikTok. Whatever trends happen on TikTok, they just follow what the analytics say. You don't see people going out there, listening to demos, finding songs, courting groups. I mean, it just doesn't happen anymore because of the internet, really. Um, and then uh, Ted goes on to say, I can understand the frustration of music lovers who get no satisfaction from current mainstream songs, though they try and try. I also lament the lack of imagina imagination on many modern hits, but I disagree with my boomer friend's larger verdict. Um, I listen to two or three hours of new music every day, and I know plenty of exceptional young musicians out there are trying to make it. They exist, but the music industry has lost its ability to discover and nurture their talents. That is a big, big thing. That is one of the things that I talk about. That they, there's very little a and uh, meaning that, that the, there used to be experienced a and people that were experienced in making records. They were experienced in signing artists. They knew great artists. They didn't have to go follow some trends and see what the latest thing on TikTok was. They actually could listen to demo tapes and or demo CDs and hear talent go engage with the groups, call the local record stores, see if they were selling anything. Now, none of that exists anymore, but they actually had to have an ear for what was going to be successful. And you were able to start trends in music or... Um, if you think think about the big trends, I mean, the last, I'm trying to think of what the last big trend in music, maybe dubstep was. Uh, you know, we can go back historically and, and look at trends in music. You know, hair metal was a trend in music. Grunge was a trend in music. Um, there, there was um, uh, trap music. There's many, you know, there's, there's different trends in EDM music that have happened. But it's harder and harder to have musical trends because everything is just uh, all research-based or things that just instantly become huge because of TikTok, really. And it's not because of, of YouTube shorts. Different audience, different energy behind it, um, or Instagram Reels. Instagram Reels is, is better uh, 
and I'm going to give you an example here. So I post on on uh, YouTube Shorts. Those of you that have been following my channel have noticed that I've been posting on Shorts. Maybe you've 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 noticed that. So I posted a short, which I'm going to play for you right now. This short is um is my latest one. This is this is on Instagram. Whoops, hold on. Let me uh, let me bring it up here. Click this. Go here. I'm going to play it for you because I want you to see what I post on Shorts for those of you who don't follow me. And this is on Instagram and I put it on TikTok. Check it out. Quick lesson. I'm always telling you, if you want to play melodically, just take the chords from the scale and connect them over the chord, right? Let's say you're in D minor. <laughs> So the that's a very simple thing, right? It's 30 seconds or so of content. Let me see how long it is, actually. It's 35 seconds, right? This is what we call short form content. On Instagram, this video has had over 400,000 views in two days. On YouTube Shorts, it's had 93,000 views. And on TikTok, it's had 22,000 views, okay? Why has it had so many views on Instagram? Well, that's because that's where musicians are. They're actually on Instagram. Does that mean that there aren't musicians on TikTok? No, of course not. Does that mean there are no musicians on YouTube short, Shorts? No. That means that people that follow my channel don't follow me on Shorts, either because they don't even know what Shorts are, or they don't get it in their feed because it doesn't come out as a... Um, uh, it doesn't come up as a new release, you don't get a notification on that, okay? So why do I do these shorts? Okay, what is the reason that I do these things? One of the reasons is that my channel is a music education channel. I've always seen it as that, whether it's talking about current trends in popular music, whether it's making videos on film scoring, whether it's making videos on music theory, this particular video, I'm gonna play it one more time because it's 35 seconds. and Listen to what I say, what it's about. Quick lesson, I'm always telling you, if you want to play melodically, just take the chords from the scale and connect them over the chord, right? Let's say you're in D minor. <laughs> That last chord I played on purpose and I turned my guitar towards the camera. And it was not only to be funny, but I wanted people to see the chord voicing that I played because it it's a kind of a unique chord in that everything you heard up until that point was in the key of D minor or D aeolian except for that last chord. The last chord had the open B string. You don't hear the note B anywhere in my example improvisation until the last chord. And when you hear that, you go, whoa, what was that? But if you're one of my girls and I play it for you, Layla and Lennon, I say, what is that last chord? You know what they said? Oh, that's that Pat Metheny chord, okay? That is a chord from a tune that I asked Pat Metheny about called April Wind that's off the Pat Metheny Group White Album, which came out in 1978. Now, when I was improvising that, that just popped into my head because that song is in D minor and he's playing it on a, a, a Nashville tune guitar. But I thought, I played the D minor, I was like, oh, I'm gonna play that Pat Metheny chord. So I turned towards the camera so people could see that and hear it. Now my daughters, because they've listened to these things, 
recognized the sound of this. And that is part of the lesson. And it's not just, I am I put on the screen all the arpeggios that I'm connecting, but it's also to grab your ear and say, whoa, what is that? That sounds cool. And there's a lot of comments, if you, especially if you go to Instagram where there are more comments, where people are remarking on that last chord. What is that last chord? Wow, that's amazing. Because it's a modal interchange. Now, all this stuff is in my Beato book. All this stuff is in my ear training course where I teach you how to hear these things and know what these things are, okay? And they're in my quick lessons course, which I demonstrate all different types of techniques and I explain, <clears throat> I play the videos like this and I will explain the things that I am doing, okay? And this is a big part of this. This is what's the purpose of my channel is to put information out for free for people so that young people can create music that even old people like and that record labels are willing to invest in instead of whatever the latest trend is and just follow from one single to the next, 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 right? And developing careers. Ideally, what you want to be able to do is you want to, um, you want to build a fan base that stays with you for your whole career, build a large live following and make a living that way. If you're, if you're an artist, that's what you want to do. That's the ultimate goal. And even if you're a YouTuber, that is the goal, right? The goal is to, my goal is to teach you. How do I do that? I make videos for free here and I make uh, uh, content, I may edu make educational content to sell on my channel that will hopefully improve people's abilities to write, to listen, to analyze music, and to create new things. Whether it's us listening to all these different genres of music when I do the top 20, 10 Spotify countdown things, or I analyze a guitar solo, or I talk about a Steve Gadd drum solo from the song Asia, or if I do a remake of Stairway to Heaven, I have Phil X and Eric Johnson on, or if I try to get Jimmy Page's sound, try to match his acoustic guitar sound and ramble on, or if I make a video on bass drum sounds or how to tune your toms or all these different things on the 950 free videos I've made on my YouTube channel or coming on here and talking about things like Ted Joya's great writing here, you know, pro provocative or th really thoughtful writing about what is going on, the current trends in the music industry, right? Because these are important things to look for, especially if you're a young artist. I'm not saying that there's no great music out there, but the fact of the matter is that the labels are not interesting and interested in nurturing. Uh, to, to quote Ted again, he's, the music industry has lost its ability to discover and nurture their talents, artist talents. He goes on to say a couple of other really, really cool things. He says, um, Music industry bigwigs have plenty of excuses for their inability to discover and adequately promote new, great new artists. The fear of copyright lawsuits, they're afraid of listening to demos, you know, because so, they might get they they might get sued. Well, they should actually the people that are getting sued are the producers that are stealing old songs, unfortunately. Um, and then it's, it goes on to say the people whose livelihood depends on discovering new music talent face legal risks if they take their job seriously. That's only one of the deleterious uh, results of the music industry's over-reliance on lawyers and litigation. Um, let's see. The problem goes deeper than just copyright concerns. The people running the music industry have lost confidence in new music. They won't admit it publicly. That would be like the priests, the, the, the priests of Jupiter and Apollo in an ancient Rome admitting their gods are dead. Even if they know it's not... Even if they know it's true, their job titles won't allow such a humble and abject confession. Yet that is exactly what's happening. The moguls have lost faith in the redemptive and life-changing power of new music. How sad is that? 
Of course, the decision makers need to pretend that they still believe in the future of their business and they want to discover the next revolutionary talent. But that's not what they really think. Their actions speak much louder than their empty words. In fact, nothing is less interesting to music executives than a completely radical new kind of music. Who can blame them for feeling that way? The radio stations will only play songs that fit their dominant formulas. This is the thing that people complain about on my Spotify playlists about is like, what is this metal playlist that you just played? Corns at the top? Corns at the top of the kick-ass metal Spotify playlist now in 2022. They're the corn's been making records since 1994. That's 30 years ago, just about, right? They're at the top of it. And that's not anything to say about corn, but we had corn. We had uh, the singer for Disturb uh, was, was in one of the songs with Nita Strauss. Um, and you know, there were some new bands in there, but a lot of the bands were older bands that are, that are in the charts. So uh, even though this is based on spins, right? The Spotify playlists, these top 10 lists are based on spins. That's how it's, how it's done. They're based on plays, on streams, whatever you want to call them. So whatever is getting the most streams are at the top of the list, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then he goes on to say, <clears throat> the algorithms curating so much of our music are even worse. Music alg algorithms are designed to be a feedback loop or to be feedback loops, ensuring that the promoted new songs are virtually identical to your favorite old songs. Anything that generally breaks the mold is excluded from the consideration almost as a rule. That's actually how, current, how the current system has been designed to work. Even the music genres famous for shaking up the world, rock or jazz or hip hop, face the same deadening industry mindset. I love jazz, but many of the radio stations focus on that genre Play songs that sound almost the same as what they featured 10 or 20 years ago. In many instances, <laughs> they are the same songs. That's true. Um, so um, and he goes on to talk about country record. The country record needs to sound a certain way just to get played on most country radio stations and playlists. And those sounds... DJs and algorithms are looking for date back to the prior century. He means the 1900s. And don't get me started on the classical music industry, where it works hard to avoid showcasing the creativity of the current generation. It's totally true. If you ever go to a classical music concert with an orchestra, it's all people with my color hair that are there in the audience, the patrons that support these, that support classical music. And they, they, they do the same programs over and over and over. I mean, they, yeah, they got a lot of my favorite composers, but man, it's, uh, you know. Anyways, my hope in this channel is that I can educate people. And don't forget, I have many old videos that you can go back and watch. I take my live streams like a lot of my whiteboard live streams that I've done that I teach things and I put them in the archive live streams playlist. People ask me, Rick, with your Beato book, if I want to find more in-depth um, uh, things on this, on a particular topic, modal interchange or some, some thing. Oh, I've made 20 videos on that. Go, you know, look, just search them on my channel, right? So it's, everything is to reinforce my ear training course, my Beato book, my quick lessons course, all of my videos are here to, to, to reinforce these things. If you do well at my ear training course, you'll be able to figure out any of these songs. Like when I do these top 10 Spotify playlists and I play along with any of the metal songs or any of the pop songs or any of that stuff. It's easy. If you have a good ear, if you use my, my ear training course, you will have a great ear. Okay. RB500 is the discount code. It's 50% off the, my Beato book, my ear training course, and my quick lessons course. I don't think we've done a 50% off court thing, have we, Billy? No. I don't believe so. No. Not, we haven't done a sale here on a live stream like that with 50% off those. I think uh, not, not this year we have not done that. Yes, yes. So... Um, 
this is a great time to get it and improve yourself as a musician. But the commentary here, talking about this stuff, um, I want people to be engaged in music. Ted makes one other interesting point, because I'm going to bring this uh, kind of back to, to even younger kids, like my kids. He talks about... Um, about um, He says, uh, even so, I refuse to accept that we are in some grim endgame, witnessing the death throes of new music. And I say that because I know how much people crave something that sounds fresh and exciting and different. If they don't find it from a major label recording or algorithm-driven playlist, they will find it somewhere. Songs can go viral nowadays without the entertainment industry even noticing until it's already happened. That will be how this story ends, not with the marginalization of new music, but with something radically emerging from an unexpected place. Okay, but I don't think to me that that unexpected place is in TikTok. <laughs> I don't. Um, I see, I hear the songs that are on TikTok that become really big songs and they are, um, uh, and that's, that's not going to be where, uh, you know, in one minute you're not going to find the songs that people that that really have the depth that um, I mean you, you need to experience music over time and songs that actually take you somewhere that that develop your imagination and can get you away from the video games that you know my kids like to play and they it's funny because they turn off the music a lot of kids turn off music in the video games because it's distracting i just think that that's funny billy do you ever do that you ever turn off music in video games or no no <laughs> but you know people that do that right no okay um anyways um i think that that when I just think that um, the kids want to own their own music. They want to own, the, you know, I, I own the music of my, of my youth. And I continue to go out there and look for new music. And, I, and as much as it, as it pains people to listen to these Spotify playlist videos, and I hadn't done one. I hadn't done a metal one in six months. I thought I should check in on it. I haven't been doing them as frequently because they don't change very often. That's one of the problems, right? So they have these pretty pretty much uh, a lot of the songs in the pop charts, not all of them, but a lot of them are pretty... Most of the people that watch my channel think they're horrendously bad. I try to look for the good in music, but if you read the comments, I just chuckle at it. Um, it's... it's uh, um, I mean, there's some pretty creative comments on it, but you know, most of it, not all of it, some of it's amazing. Uh, but most of these, the things that are in the top of the charts is pretty terrible, unfortunately. And maybe it's always been the case. Maybe the top of the charts have always been the case. But if I listen to the song of the year, if I compared... Montero, let's say, I don't know if that's the song of the year, but that's one of the big hits this year, versus uh, Kiss from a Rose by Seal, which was the song of the year in 1996 or 95. Um, oh my God, there is no comparison between these songs. One of them is a song. Another one is a just musical production. And the one that's a song is Kiss from a Rose by Seal. That is an incredible song. I mean, that song just blows me away. And uh, I did a What Makes This Song Great on it. And that is a song that is perfect from the beginning through the end. It's got perfect production values. Every part that's in that song is impeccably played and impeccably thought and performed. Seal's vocals are phenomenal. They are not auto-tuned. It's all done on tape. It's so creative. And it just blows me away to think, and, and the orchestral arrangement's amazing on it, to think that we've come from that to some of the 
terrible music that is uh, that has been on the charts this that on the pop charts this past year. Um, and when I find stuff that I really like, you guys know there's plenty of stuff out there that I like of new contemporary music, much to, to many people's dismay on our channel. But, uh, but anyways, Ted makes some very, very interesting points on this, and, and it's got me to think a lot about it. And um, anyways, so you should follow Ted. Follow him on Twitter and uh, check out his, his article in The Atlantic. I follow Ted on his Substack um, also. So uh, discount code RB500 for today's stream. If you want to support the channel and learn something in the meantime, get my Beato Ear Training course, my Beato book, or my Quick Lessons Pro course. They're all 50% off. This is the time to do it. That's worth less than, uh, you know, that's like a quarter of what you'll pay for one lesson at your local music store. These things, or maybe what you pay for one lesson nowadays. So, um, and you got 950 free videos of which to, uh, to check out for free on my channel. So you guys are amazing, 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 amazing. Food for thought. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your weekend. All right. We'll see you.